Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I have a baseball player that I like to watch. I like his way of doing things, his hustle, as it were. His name is Harrison Bader. He's the center fielder for the St. Louis Cardinals. A little bit younger than me, 28, but I love watching him play. He goes after it. He runs extremely fast. He is always trying to win. As I said, he hustles. Well, that is until last Saturday where he was taken out of the game in the sixth inning. And as the manager said, he wasn't hustling. He had given up. See, the team was down three runs, and I guess Harrison Bader decided that it was time to give up, not hustle. He said it was a good learning opportunity for him to know that, hey, you're part of the team. You need to hustle. Keep fighting. Try to win. Keep playing. And so he learned his lesson. I can imagine that you probably said, hey, giving up is not the answer. Giving up is something we don't want to do. In fact, we always try to remind people to don't give up. Work harder. Go the extra mile. You can do this. Keep going. The idea of giving up is so terrible that there are family mottos that say victory or death. Meaning there is no retreating. It is victory or death you die. There is no in-between. Don't give up. You can only pursue victory, and if you can't, might as well die. We don't like giving up, but there are times when you will have to give up. And continuing with our sports analogy here, when time runs out and your team is down, there is nothing else to do but give up. The time has run out. There is no extra play. There is no opportunity. The game is over. You lose. Give up. Oftentimes in our life, there are opportunities that pass us by, and you have to give up on that opportunity. It just won't happen. And whatever that might be in your life, that an opportunity has come before you and you missed it, you know you have to give up and get over it. But there are other times when we give up that's not necessarily out of our control. It's in our control to, to try to pursue an answer, right? But yet, we still give up on marriage. We still give up on our friends. We give up on you name it. And the reason we give up on this is sometimes we just desire it. Just get it over with. I'm done. I'm tired. That's our sinful nature speaking out there. That we're, we want to give up. We don't want to deal with this anymore. We'd rather pursue something that we perceive that's better for us. Or another way we can give up is that we can't find a way in our lives to forgive. I can't forgive that person. I give up. I'm done. I'm moving on. Giving up, no matter how it is, whether it's a game or a missed opportunity or a sinful desire, giving up just does not make us feel good. We feel weak. Take if you get injured and you're in a boot, right? Or you have an injury that causes you not to have feeling in your hand. Yeah, you feel weak. You feel like you had to give up something. Giving up makes us feel powerless, Especially if you go in to talk to your boss and he says, I have to let you go. You're powerless now. How will you feed your family? Giving up makes us feel disloyal. That you broke your word. You had to work a little extra time at the office and I'm sorry I missed your event. And you realize you couldn't be the person you said you would be. Giving up is something we try to avoid. Because it makes us feel weak, powerless, and disloyal. And giving up can be out of our control or within our control. It is not fun to give up. 
but yet it is a part of our life as we go about in our sinful nature. In our Old Testament text today, we do have someone who wants to give up, Elijah. And he says this very phrase to God twice. He speaks to God about how he wants to give up, and he says this, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. He repeats this twice to God, saying, Look, your people have given up. They've given up on your promises, your covenant. They've thrown down your altars. They've given up on sacrificing to you. And I, the only one left, if, are, is ready to give up. Before this moment, in just a few verses before this, Elijah performs a wonderful miracle, a great miracle with the help of the Lord. He stands on a mountain with the prophets of Baal, and the prophets of Baal are trying to light a sacrifice by praying to their God. They don't. Elijah pours water after water onto the sacrifice and prays to God, and God lights the sacrifice on fire. And Elijah continues on from there and attacks and kills the prophets of Baal as they flee down the mountain. He has done something extraordinary, but nobody likes the fact that he did this. Ahab tells Jezebel, and Jezebel seeks to kill Elijah. And so he flees and runs and runs and runs, becomes tired and lays his head down under a broom tree to die. He's giving up. And God sends an angel to feed him and says, continue on your way, be strengthened. But as we read here today, he still wants to give up. He wants to die. But God comes to him in a windstorm, in an earthquake and fire. But Elijah does not go out to see the Lord in those. But when a whisper comes, he puts on his cloak and goes out to hear what the Lord has to say to him. That wind, earthquake, and fire reminds us of the law, the commands of God to do this and not do that. But that whisper reminds us of the mercy, forgiveness, hope, and love that God gives to us. And Elijah listens to the Lord his God. As he desires to give up, to die, he listens to him and receives mercy, forgiveness, and hope. And God tells Elijah, do not give up, you're not the only one. God tells him, Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. 7,000 is way more than one. There are 7,000 who continue to worship the Lord. Elijah, you're not the only one. You shall not give up. And in fact, Elijah, you're not going to die. You'll read in the next book, right at the beginning, that Elijah, in fact, doesn't die. He is carried up into heaven to remind us of how God takes care of us. Did not allow Elijah to give up and die. Here, Elijah is told about the forgiveness and mercy and love and hope that God has for him. How others also fear, trust, and love in God above all things. And as Elijah goes on, he anoints kings and anoints and consecrate Elisha. Now the odd thing here with Elisha is that he also gives up something. Elijah throws his cloak over Elisha as he is plowing the fields with 12 yokes of oxen. That means 24 oxen. Now I've seen some big tractors here in Indiana, but I don't know how big and how long 24 oxen would be. But just a cloak over his shoulders tells Elisha that he has to give up this life of wealth and go with Elisha to be a prophet of the word. And in fact, to show this, he turns back and sacrifices the oxen to feed the people in the region, giving up his wealth to go and pursue the word of God. He has committed himself to what God has in store for him. And what we can see here is that when you commit, 
When you promise, when you vow, you have to give up something. When you commit yourself, you have to give up. Now this give up is not normally said that way. It's usually called you have to sacrifice. When you commit, you must sacrifice. And we see that as we sacrifice for others in our commitments with each other, in marriage. You have to give up things. You must sacrifice for the other. Men, you are to lay your life down for your wife. Parents, you are to look after your children. I know that you have had sleepless nights with your children and you have worried for them. Children, remember, your parents worry about you. Commit yourself to them. Sacrifice a little so they know you are safe. Let them know. There are people who submit themselves and commit themselves and sacrifice for our well-being and our armed forces. But with the decision by the Supreme Court just recently, well, I read a comment by a person who has given up. He does not want to commit himself anymore. And this is what he has to say when the Roe v. Wade was abolished. This is why I left my church. This is why I will take my job and leave the military. I am tired of accidentally defending those who did not deserve my sacrifice. I'm tired of accidentally defending those who do not deserve my sacrifice. I want you to know, you don't deserve the sacrifices that are given to you. We're sinful, all of us, every single one to the core. We are undeserving, but yet we have committed ourselves to each other and we sacrifice for each other because that is what we do when we have made a promise and a vow. We sacrifice even for those who are undeserving. When we volunteer, we volunteer our time for the service of others. We sacrifice of ourselves. Our volunteer staff for the VBS, they have sacrificed their time to raise our children in the Word of God. You as Christians sacrifice. You have to put off your sinful self to continue on to be the people God has made you to be. Our youth who are here in attendance today, they are sacrificing time and sleep and a bunch of other things to go on the National Youth Gathering in a couple weeks. Youth, let me remind you, you're sacrificing sleep, you're sacrificing time, you'll be in lines. No, this is all good stuff because your commitment to hearing God's Word and those Bible studies there. Sacrifice is part of being committed to something. Sacrifice is part of being committed to something. You have to give up because of your vow. Now, your gut reaction is, no, I won't give up. But Paul reminds us about our freedom and where we are to be in the Spirit. He writes, For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. You have been given freedom, commitment to each other, serve, sacrifice for one another. In our epistle text, it continues, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. As we walk committed to our Lord, we have to give up our passions, our sins, our flesh, our temptation, and go where the Lord has commanded us to go. And again he writes, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Paul says, You who are committed to Christ Jesus must crucify, let die the passions of the flesh to pursue what God has given you. Your commitment to the Lord means that you sacrifice. You sacrifice your own desires, your own sinful desires, to do what the Lord has commanded you to do. Now that's tough. It's tough to give up. It's tough not to pursue the things that you enjoy that are really sinful pleasures. And God knows this, so He gives up. He gives up His Son. He gives up Jesus Christ for you as a sacrifice because he has made a commitment to you, a promise to you to give you hope, mercy, and forgiveness. 
God has given up his son. He has sacrificed his son for you. And in our gospel text, Jesus walking with the people and the disciples tells you how much he is committed to you and how much he will sacrifice for you. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Christ has no home. He sacrifices the idea of being a homeowner so that he can minister to the people and sacrifice for you. And indeed, he has nowhere to lay his head when he dies. There is no tomb that he owns. He is given a borrowed tomb where he will, his dead body will lie. He tells them, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And he does. He is committed to proclaiming what the kingdom of God is, who the Father is and what he has done for you. And lastly, no one puts his hand to the plow and looks back, is fit for the kingdom of God. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus does not look back. He looks dead forward to Jerusalem, to the crucifixion, to give up his life for you, to be the commitment that it takes to forgive you of all of your sins. Christ has given up his exaltedness in heaven to dwell amongst us to be our Savior. He gives up his life for you so that you would be forgiven. 1 Peter, the namesake for our church, writing here in his first book in chapter 2, you yourselves are like living stones, are being built up as spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You are being built up as the committed ones to Christ, that he has committed himself to you to make you a holy priesthood, and you offer up spiritual sacrifices according to his will. I draw your attention to the sermon hymn we sang just before this sermon. And it reminds us of how much commitment we have and how God has committed himself to us. The first verse goes like this. Come follow me, the Savior spake, all in my way abiding. Deny yourselves, the world forsake. Obey my call and guiding. Obey the cross, whatever betide. Take my example for your guide. Jesus is our guide. He has given up his life for us for forgiveness. And so when you must give up, remember the Lord gave up his life. And if you give up in sinfulness, know you are forgiven because of Christ and his sacrifice. He is committed to you so that you have life. Commit yourself so that you will have life as well. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.